Welcome to the second training movie in the Coral Finder Toolkit 2.0 training movie series. In the previous movie, we were introduced to the Coral Finder Toolkit resources and the problem of coral identification. For this movie, you will need a copy of the Coral Finder and have read the How to Use and Glossary pages. Now, 10 basic terms you will require to use the Coral Finder. Please note that there are many more terms we could learn in connection with coral identification, especially when considering species ID. But for now, we will keep it simple so we can get hands-on as quick as possible. The first thing we need to understand is the name we wish to give to corals. In the scientific classification scheme, all corals have a two-part or binomial name made up of a genus and species name. The scientific description of physical characters allows us to classify the world around us. By using a combination of unique and shared characters, scientists can highlight the degree of relatedness between two organisms. For example, the coral genus Acropora has well over 100 species, each with unique species-defining characteristics. But each of these species also share common characters that show their relatedness. In the example of the genus Acropora, the axial corallite at the tip of each branch is a common character that defines their relatedness and membership of the genus. Understanding how to ID coral genera, the plural of coral genus, is the natural learning level for the beginner because it reduces the number of groups to understand and learn. Once you understand coral genera, the door to species level ID will open. Being able to reliably and consistently recognize corals to genus level is a measure of community richness and can, if done systematically, provide a measure of reef health over time. The Coral Finder lets you learn how to identify coral genera. With field experience and some mentorship, your confidence will grow and you'll be able to teach others. Eventually, you'll begin to see the species and their differences among the genus level similarities. Before we meet the key terms and concepts used by the Coral Finder to separate common coral genera, we first need to know what defines a hard coral. Hard corals are animals with polyps, a simple tube with a hole at one end, the mouth, surrounded by a ring of tentacles. They differ from anemones by having an internal limestone skeleton. The skeleton and the polyps that form hard corals are further distinguished by having a six-fold symmetry. This symmetry is most easily seen in very young corals. Look closely for the six dominant spikes in these pictures of newly settled coral skeletons. Known as primary septa, they are the foundation elements of the coral skeleton and are surrounded by younger cycles of septa in multiples of six. The appearance of this six-fold symmetry varies with the coral families. Here, a newly settled coral from the genus Porites, in the family Porytidae, shows the same six-fold symmetry obscured by the complex skeletal detail characteristic of this family. The point is that all hard corals have skeletons and six-fold symmetry, even if you can't see it. This diagram is from the glossary page of your coral finder, which you should open up and follow along with. To use the coral finder effectively, you need to learn the terms in blue. These terms and concepts have been culled from hundreds in use by coral taxonomists, so it's a fairly painless way to start. The Coral Finder is the bridge between our underwater and topside experience 
of corals. Underwater, we see the tissue of the living animal, while topside, we can look at the bleached coral skeleton. The coral finder helps bring this all together. Once you learn these terms, you will be able to recognize around 70 genera. The coral's internal limestone skeleton is secreted by the tissue that overlies it. The tissue is separate from the skeleton, and in some corals like this Cynarina, the skeleton can be seen through the tissue when the coral inflates it with water. The coral skeleton is built by the inner surface of the polyp animal, and it is called a corallite. Although there are many types of coral that often look very different from each other, this fundamental principle remains the same. The living animal is called the polyp, and it lives in its own skeletal cup called a corallite. And when polyps clone themselves into groups of corallites, they form a colony. Now let's take a tour of the coral's anatomy. Each polyp has a mouth with tentacles. The mouth of the coral polyp is at the centre of the oral disc. When the coral is actively feeding, the polyps draw water in through the mouth, inflating the tissue and expanding feeding tentacles around the mouth. Some coral species will extend tentacles and other fleshy structures during the day, but the majority feed at night. In this coral, the mouth and tentacles sit at the end of large inflated stalked polyps. If disturbed, the coral can retract this tissue back tight against the skeleton by expelling the water inside, as can be seen at the centre of the image. This coral has tentacles that withdraw during the day and are hidden behind grape-like bubbles of tissue known as vesicles. At night, the tentacles expand and push through to feed. In corals like this, the shape and form of the underlying skeleton is often completely hidden from the observer. In this photo, we can see a polyp with more than one mouth inside the coralite wall. It is not unusual for polyps to have multiple mouths. In this coral, the polyps have multiple mouths inside meandering valleys. At night, the many mouths become surrounded by hundreds of feeding tentacles that bear stinging cells to capture zooplankton food. Now we see multiple polyp mouths on a colony. There is probably only one mouth per polyp here, but it is not really important. You just need to recognize where the mouth is no matter what it looks like. Note, the mouth and the surrounding area of the polyp known as the oral disc are often a different colour from the rest of the coral. Now it's time to go below the tissue and learn the terms that describe the coral skeleton, starting with the polyp animal's home, the coralite. The coralite wall separates a polyp from other polyps and the coralites they create. It is important to recognise coralite walls as they are the basis for separating many coral genera. Here we see a group of coralites with separate walls. Check your coral finder graphic to get a three-dimensional view of this concept. Now we can see the skeleton equivalent that lies under the tissue. Note the relationship between the polyp and the coralite it creates. In this coral, there is a separate wall for each coralite. Note how the wall acts as a scaffold for other skeletal elements that we will learn about soon. Here are some examples of corals in which the coralites have separate walls. While the scale and detail of coralites may vary, the concept of a separate wall structure remains. <laughs>
Now let's look at corals with shared walls. Note the absence of a gap or valley between each polyp. With the polyp tissue removed, we can see how each polyp has built a corallite that shares a structural wall. All the other elements of the coral remain the same. Again, check the Coral Finder glossary image to understand what the role of the corallite wall is in 3D. Here is a coral with meandering corallites and a shared wall. And here is a coral with meandering corallites that have separate walls. Now we have an example of a coral with indistinct walls. Note the ridges that flow uninterrupted between the polyps. The wall structure is indistinct or absent, giving the polyps a visual continuity or flow. With the tissue removed, the corallites show the walls are poorly developed or absent. Being able to recognize shared, separate, or indistinct corallite walls is easy and an important part of the coral finder's approach to separating the coral genera. Now we move on to the final group of terms you need to use the coral finder to its full power. Scepter, costi, and septocosti. These new terms describe the many parallel ridges of skeleton that arise from the center of each corallite and which can often be seen through the tissue of the polyp. The name used for these ridges of skeleton is defined by the relationship of these structures to the corallite wall. So, the parallel ridges found within the wall are known as septa. When they cross over the wall, they are known as costi. Septa and costi often carry spines and bumps, collectively known as ornament. Taxonomists often use these features as part of species descriptions. In this photo, the costi, but not the septa, are beaded. Note how the colony surface is also beaded. Another example. This is a coral with meandering polyps and separate walls. Note the large teeth lining the septa and costi. These teeth can also be seen as rows of bumps in the tissue of the living animal on the right. In this example, we have a coral with indistinct walls. In the absence of a clear wall, the distinction between septa and costi breaks down. Now we use the term septocosti to describe the linear skeletal elements that flow between each corallite center. In this photo, they are very clear, even through the tissue. Here is another coral with indistinct walls and, therefore, Septocosti. This coral has large granular teeth on its septocosti. This is just ornament. It doesn't change the concepts we are discussing. The mouths and the polyp centers are a little obscure. See the blue box. And are defined by a thickening of the septocosti as they approach the mouth. This is an example of how we will use the few key terms you are learning to uniquely describe the characteristics of a coral genus, such that you can identify it underwater anywhere in the Indo-Pacific. Let's do that again. Here is part of the description of the coral genus Podobasia from the Coral Finder. Septocosti flow between corallites. Check. And thicken near corallite centers. Check. Septocosti at right angle to the colony margin. Check. The few terms you have just learnt are the core language of the coral finder. It is these tight descriptions of visual clues 
that make the Coral Finder work. So that concludes our tour of the key terms required to use the Coral Finder. There are many more terms associated with Coral ID and these become important when you start to work with species. But for now you don't need them. To finish this movie, we are going to learn some tips and tricks that beginners will find helpful. This image shows us ideal examples of corals with shared, separate and indistinct walls. Tip number one is to be careful about the scale of corals. This branching coral has very small, less than one millimetre, coralites that can be too small to see clearly underwater. A second problem with this coral is the fine, granular, sandy texture of these coralites, which makes it hard to see where the polyp mouths are. Corals with very small polyps and complex ornament are hard to understand underwater. In reality, there are very few corals like this, but they are common enough to cause problems. So the simplest solution is just to learn to recognize them. This one is called Samacora. Generally speaking, corals have either shared, separate or indistinct walls. But there are some corals where recognizing the wall structure can be confusing. The problem is when corals produce skeletal ornament that looks like coralite walls, but isn't. In the example below, we can see three different colonies of the genus Pavona, showing skeletal ridges on the colony surface. As you can see, the degree to which these ridges are developed can vary a lot. Look closely and you will see that between the ridges there are coralites with indistinct walls that are typical of Pavona. Just as a reminder, here is what Pavona looks like without the ridges. So it is important to recognize when ridges are skeletal ornament on the colony surface and not coralite walls. In this example, the genus Samacora has ridges that form valleys containing groups of coralites with indistinct walls. In close-up view, you can see how the coralites are linked by granular septocosti. In this example, we have all the tricky problems together at the same time. Very small coralites, granular or ornamented septocosti, and confusing ridges on the colony surface. Here is the last example of a coral you might find confusing. This coral is covered in valleys that look like they are formed by shared walls. But up close, we can see the valleys are actually circular ridges formed by the way the coral grows. So these are growth ridges and not coralite walls. If we look closer, we also see some isolated polyp mouths between the growth ridges. These coralites are independent of the growth ridges. They do not need them. The ridges are therefore not coralite walls. One final point. In the absence of any walls, the parallel lines running between the coralite centers are therefore septocosti. Let's quickly summarize the important terms and concepts covered in this movie. The terms in blue on the glossary page are all you need to know to drive the coral finder and recognize over 70 Indo-Pacific coral genera. Finding the polyp mouth is the first step to understanding your coral. You then need to recognize what kind of wall structure the coralites have. Shared, separate, 
or absent indistinct. You need to be mindful that the wall structure can sometimes be hidden by ornament growing on the scepter costi or scepto costi. Examples of ornament can be teeth, spines or beads. Another thing to watch out for are ornamental ridges growing on the colony surface that look like coralite walls and hide the coralite's true wall structure. These ridges are usually a byproduct of the way the coral grows. Finally, watch out for corals with very small coralites. They are easy to ignore. So that's it. Now you know everything you need to become an expert. See you in the next movie.